And uh, hey, everybody, it's uh, Michael Moore. And uh, thank you for joining us on this live stream. Uh, the, uh, we're barely into a day and a half of the release of this new movie, Planet of the Humans. Uh, it's this, uh, some of you have already watched it. Maybe some of you haven't. Uh, that's okay. Stick with us. Uh, join in the conversation here. We're going to talk a little bit about it. I've got the filmmakers uh, here with me. I'm the executive producer of this film, and I'm presenting it uh, for free on my YouTube channel. And some of you are watching this on YouTube. A lot of you, I think, uh, uh, we're also on uh, my Facebook, uh, Michael Moore Facebook. It's M.M. Flint. Um, we're also on Twitter, my Twitter, M.M. Flint. Um, we're on, uh, geez, we're on other, uh, we're on Now This, uh, we're on the, uh, uh, the DSA Now uh, channel, um, a bunch of others. I'm probably, I'm leaving them out, but I'll, I will um, mention them uh, as we go along. We have, this film is years in the making, Planet of the Humans. Uh, it sprung from an idea in Jeff Gibbs's head a number of years ago, and a lot of us have been, you know, we've been environmentalists since we were teenagers in high school. Um, I was at the first Earth Day uh, 50 years ago today. I was presenting my Eagle Scout project, which I had made a, a documentary, um, which essentially was an automated slideshow with music and narration called Pollution in My Hometown. And um, I was showing it to people in my hometown in Michigan. And I was very concerned as a teenager in 1970 uh, of what we were doing to our town, to our planet. And I and Jeff and, and uh, the producer of this film, Ozzy Zennert, will also be with us. Uh, we've, we've been environmentalists our, our entire lives. We've been very active in the environmental movement. But after decades of this and seeing how the bad guys were winning the battle, whether it's the battle uh, against uh, climate change for clean air and clean water for a habitable planet, protecting the species on this planet, all the different facets and elements of what we call the environmental movement. And yet here we are 50 years later. And when we ask ourselves this question, is the earth in better shape than it was 50 years ago today? And we know what the answer to that is. It's not. It's in much worse shape. I mean, this is not to say that good things didn't happen, especially early on. We passed a Clean Water Act, a Clean Air Act, uh, uh, fuel emissions on automobiles, uh, a whole bunch of things that we, the Environmental Protection Agency was created. This was all in the very first, pretty much the first five years after Earth Day. And other good things happen. And, and then over time, we kept seeing and feeling, realizing that our planet actually wasn't being saved. It was getting worse. And we had people come along and warn us about this. Um, and we didn't heed the warning. And then the movement itself started to take a turn toward... Um, listening to people with money who offered to help fund the environmental movement. And um, things just never got better. And as much as we were all pulling together, and I think we all are part of the majority of this country and of the world, um, who were really, we were all, I think, hell-bent on stopping what was being done to our atmosphere, to our people. Um, We've been losing this battle. And so Jeff decided we needed to make a film and we needed to talk about what our concerns were that if we're going down certain roads to save the planet and those roads aren't working, what do we need to do? Because we can't keep going down the wrong road or maybe wrong is the, is the wrong word, the ineffectual road. And so Jeff and Ozzy made this incredible film and I've been supporting it uh, since the, the beginning of it and giving my advice or whatever. But 
This is a, it's a powerful film. It's, it's uh, some people will find it somewhat depressing, but I don't see it that way. I think anytime we're willing to take a look at what is it that we're doing and what are we doing right and what are we doing wrong? And let's have that discussion. And maybe we need to have a, we need to frame the discussion in an entirely different way than the way it's been framed so that we can succeed. All the young people who have been active in these recent years uh, with the Sunrise Movement, Extinction Rebellion, Greta and her um, Friday uh, school strike, all of these things have been so heartening to us in the sense that young people get it and they realize that the planet that we're handing them is not a gift. It's going to be an enormous burden and an, and an incredible tragedy that they and their children, if we last that long, are going to have to deal with. We're coming to you right now tonight in the midst of this pandemic. And of course, some of you are saying, why are you bothering us with this during a pandemic? I can't think of a better time because, we, first of all, we've all had some time to think, haven't we, this month? Think about the things that aren't working. Everybody talks about, let's get back to normal. I don't want to go back to normal. I don't want, to, I don't want the normal of going from 350 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere to now it's over 410, 410 parts per million. We have been failing. We have been losing. And no matter what happy face some people want to put on this, this is the time right now we should be thinking about when we come out of this pandemic, how are we going to fix this planet and fix ourselves so that what we're going through now, I personally think is, is um, minor league compared to what, we're, what the planet and the atmosphere and the climate and the environment and those in power, those with the money, what's going to happen to us? The next thing that's going to happen, not going to be necessarily a coronavirus, something we can't even think of right now. So we're here with you live. Um, before I introduce uh, Jeff and Ozzy, uh, I just want to show you a very brief uh, trailer. If you haven't seen the movie yet, uh, you can go to my YouTube channel if you're on YouTube right now here after we're done. It's free. Um, I want you to watch this. Uh, it's going to blow your mind. It's going to get you thinking about things we haven't been thinking about. And maybe maybe some of you are going to help us come up with the ideas and the solutions that, that uh, we need to put forth here. Uh, because the way we've been doing it, God bless everybody who's been part of it. We've been part of it. Uh, but look where we're at, folks. Let's just be honest with ourselves. Coming up here with uh, Jeff Gibbs and Ozzy Zenner. But first, uh, this little trailer from Planet of the Humans. There's no turning back. I don't think the people in charge are near nervous enough. Okay, we are back, and I'd like you uh, to please welcome uh, the writer, director, editor of this film. Um, I've known him for a long time. He was the co-producer a Bowling for Columbine and Fahrenheit 9-11. And this is his debut film. Uh, please welcome Jeff Gibbs. Jeff, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, here we go. Okay. So, right, we are, and we are doing proper social distancing here because we are at least 900 miles <laughs> apart right now. So I feel completely safe around you. We're in different parts of the continent. Yeah, that's true. That is true. Um, but thank you so much, Jeff, for this film. And let's bring in the producer of Planet of the Humans, uh, Mr. Ozzy Zenner. Zen Ozzy, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. How are you doing? Oh, great, great. And great. Um, now, where, where are you at tonight? I'm in San Francisco. San Francisco. And Jeff, yep. you're in Traverse City, Michigan? Northern Michigan, yep. And I'm in my uh, my podcast studio for Rumble uh, here in my apartment in New York, in New York City. Um, so thank you, everybody, for joining us. And why don't we, why don't we just get right to this? Uh, Jeff, tell people why you made this film. Why, I mean, you really, I know this because I've watched 
you in, in and out of projects that we've worked on over these years, um, you have been making this film nonstop. And uh, it's been an incredible endeavor to witness. Um, what made you give so much of your life and yourself and everything to make this documentary, Planet of the Humans? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, well before I started making this film, um, I think it was the late 90s and the early 2000s when I really began to notice, you know, after living a certain amount of my life that um, that things weren't getting better, as you said. And um, long, even back then, I was noticing that the farmers were having trouble with the bees. You know, the, the bees were dying off. And I noticed that the trees weren't healthy. Uh, and then Katrina hit. Um, I just, I thought, wow, this is interesting how things are getting worse, but we just all carry on like everything's uh, kind of normal. Um, so as I got involved with filmmaking, I started to document, you know, the decline of nature. And I was thinking, oh, I just need to make the best film on how things are falling apart. And that'll wake us up. Uh, maybe that'll wake me up. Maybe it'll wake us up out of our stupor. But as I made this, you know, uh, documented things going wrong with nature, you know, invasive species, you know, remember when our beach was covered with these razor sharp zebra mussels that would cut your feet? I mean, just thing after thing, giant invasive carp taking over the Illinois River. Um, Mountaintop removal, you know, the coal issue, we, we, we were, I was documenting that. But for some reason, it slowly dawned on me, could we be making a mistake? You know, is it just the other side that has this wrong? Um, and the first time I went to a solar festival uh, that was said to be powered by solar, and as you see in the movie, um, and heard some generators going back behind the stage. And well, what are the generators for? And what are these power lines for? It's just kind of blew my mind uh, because I had, uh, you know, going back to Earth Day, I had built a, my own solar collector, solar hot water heater for the science fair, um, you know, in the sixth grade, even before Earth Day. Uh, Earth Day came and I was just like, wow, an adult's talking about the environment. I was just, um, you know, and, and so from an early I age, just, I was I wondering. Right I've known you for a long time. You built that solar uh, uh, water heater in sixth, sixth grade. This is before, you're right, before Earth Day. Um, my, my three science fair projects were a model of the planetary system made of styrofoam balls, which you can't do now, the solar hot water heater, and then a machine that generated weather uh, with a heat source, like a, you know, a hurricane. So um, I remember seeing, you know, we, we'd heard about climate change even back then. If you remember, we saw some film uh, video stuff back in elementary school. But um, so this really crept up on me as I switched from documenting the state of the planet to what is the holdup with green energy? And is it really what it's cracked up to be? And the shocking thing was the deeper I went into this, um, the kind of the darker it got. Um, and then a light bulb went off where I realized that sometimes a civilization or a people were in the wrong story. You know, we all need stories. We all need myths. We all need, uh, a collective consciousness that binds us together, a collective truth. But sometimes that story goes astray. It's easy to see how people on the right, to me, I mean, I just, I watch the TV and I just, you know, like many people, I just can't believe the things that they think are true. But it's much harder to say, do we have blind spots? Could we have some of the story wrong? I mean, we on the other side of the political fence. We on the other side, those of us on the left that have cared right. about the environment our entire lives. Could we be part of what's not working? Right. Right. Well, I think, yes, we've all had our kind of uh, epiphanies with this. And um, I mean, years and years ago, I had a newspaper in, in uh, Flint, Michigan. And I remember um, one day I decided to follow the recycling truck. I was going around picking up the bottles and the cans and all this. Just say, where does the, where do they really take this stuff? It's just my curious kind of skeptical eye that I have. And um, I followed it for, I don't know, 20, 25 miles. And that truck took it to a dump, to a landfill, and just, just dumped it all. And I thought, wow, uh, people should know this. But then the, the thing goes off, you say, no, but don't tell people that because then they won't recycle. And don't give them the bad news. And I remember thinking that, and, I, and I'm like, no, I, you have to tell people these things 
are going on. If they stop recycling, they stop recycling. But and then Frontline on PBS a week or two ago does a whole documentary. And this is now, geez, how many years later? This would be 30 years or longer later than I did that and saw that. And now they're showing us how all this plastic is ending up in our oceans. So, so I've been skeptical about a lot of this stuff, even though I've been very supportive and part of and going to demonstrations and all of this for all this time. But, but the facts are the facts. And um, we were told that we could, should not go above 350 parts uh, per million of carbon in the atmosphere. We're way over that now. We were told that was the limit. If we went past that, that's it. I believe that. I believe it now. I believe we're in serious, serious trouble. And um, uh, we need action. And, and we need some new, fresh thinking, which is what I'm hoping young people are bringing to this right now. Because, because the, the old way, while it worked at first, it lost its way on some level. And some people lost their way. And some organizations lost their way. And you show this in the film. It's a difficult pill to swallow when you show us what groups like the Sierra Club have become, why certain environmental leaders are associating themselves with Goldman Sachs, uh, with Wall Street, um, with, with the timber industry, and how even environmental groups don't understand. They promoted biomass. Some of them continue to do that. This is the burning of trees and waste, putting more pollution up in the air, uh, not creating the kind of energy that we need. But I think, Ozzy, let me bring you into this. This is where the film really takes a turn, where we say, you know, this really isn't a discussion about um, renewable energy or um, all these things that we've just been talking about, but it's really about who are we and why do we allow a system of greed, the profit motive, perpetual growth, all of these things, that how we structure ourselves, the, how we structure the economy, how we structure ourselves politically. And we, we've somehow missed the boat here. And I desperately want us to get back on track. And, um, and I know you've studied and you wrote a, a book about this called Green Illusions about how we're, we sort of, we hang, we hang on to this belief that, yes, we're doing something. I've got an electric car. I've, 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 I'm putting up a windmill. I, I put my bottle in that that blue basket. And I think, and I certainly was feeling back when I discovered some of the big lie of of recycling, that um, it made me feel good to put the bottle in the blue container. I felt like every day I did my daily duty as a citizen, as an environmentalist, to save this planet. And how long really was I deluding myself that that is really what I need to do or that's all I need to do that, you know, you've studied this for quite some time. Why don't you give us your feelings about this? Well, for me, it started, it's interesting actually that you bring that up because I, I used to um, work as an architect and uh, there's what I found a kind of a, disconnect between what we think of doing as environmentalists and what might actually really have an impact. Uh, I was working for a client who had this house with two large trees outside of it and the trees would shade the house in the summer from the sun and then in the winter the tree the leaves would fall off and and the sun would shine through and kind of warm the building during the winter. This was in Washington DC and he wanted to make this a solar house, but in order to do so, we had to chop down the trees. And I ran the calculations to figure out, well, you know, well, maybe it's worth it to get the solar cells on the on the roof. And and it wasn't even close. I mean, it was like a factor of 10 times worse. And, and, and that's assuming that you're essentially getting fully clean energy from solar back then. I didn't understand. Uh, and you kind of I was in a position of having to decide, well, are we going to chop down the trees so we could have these solar cells? Or are we going to keep the trees that are shading this this house and then allowing the sun to go through in the in, in the winter? And and I said we should keep the trees. We should spend the money on, on energy efficiency and, and these sorts of things. Uh, and uh, and I was fired. So <laughs> that's where that went. And that was a rude awakening 
Uh, and, and that's actually one of the things that started me on this journey uh, of finding out why these stories are so seductive to us and what it is about them. What, what is it that, that, that brings us into those stories uh, so strongly? And, and that's how I started uh, working on Green Illusions and I eventually met Jeff uh, during the book tour. The, um, it's amazing, I have to say, that we went live with us yesterday morning and just this last day, there have been close to 700,000 views of this film here on YouTube. This is, I thought, man, if we get 100,000 in the first week, uh, this would be great. That that it's going to push past 700,000 um, probably during uh, this live stream. And um, the response has been incredible. I mean, the, the emails people have sent to me at um, michael at michaelmoore.com, uh, the, the postings on my site, on this site. Uh, I've got a number of questions from people. A lot of people have questions, mostly though a lot of comments. I have to tell you, the, um, the number one comment is not so much that, that people have been like exposed to something that they never thought of, just the opposite. A lot of people have been wondering what's going on. Why are we in the position we're in right now? Why are we losing this battle, whether it's against climate change or a whole host of other things? Um, and in watching this film, um, Ray says uh, here, this just blew my mind. But I have been thinking for some time, wait a minute, wait a minute. And then all of a sudden, this film answers the wait a minute question in my head. Um, a lot of a lot of notes like that uh, from people, but also a lot of people saying, you know, wanting, and I know this from my own films, that people want a solution, obviously. It's not enough. You know, when you go to the doctor and the doctor says to you, you have cancer, you don't say to the doctor, yeah, well, what's the cure? <laughs> and you don't get mad at the doctor for not having the cure. There is no cure for cancer. What you say is, thank God for telling me I've got cancer. Now, what are we going to do? What can you and I do together? So I think this is what a lot of a lot of people are feeling. This film has told the people who watched it today that um, that there is a cancer. It's the cancer that we know about, how we've treated this planet and the environment. But the other cancer is um, where the environmental movement is and what it's been doing. And, and why have certain elements of this movement sold out? What are they doing with the billionaire class? Why is corporate America all of a sudden so interested in green energy? Because there's obviously money to be made. Um, it's, it's, it, so how do you answer, Jeff, those people who um, are asking for what's the solution? Or um, I just felt so... Like at the end of this movie, and the movie, I have to tell you, I have to warn you, actually. I mean, the last 10 minutes of it are maybe one of the most moving and brutally effective endings of a documentary I've ever seen. Um, what do you say to people, Jeff? They've just you know, finished watching the movie. Yeah, I think we're in a time when we're getting um, a good lesson in what we need to do. Um, and unfortunately, it's coming through the pandemic. It's coming through um, deaths that shouldn't be and uh, the mishandling of the pandemic. But the pandemic emerged from a planet that's very upset with us. You know, it's, it's as if our Mother Earth said, time out, go to your room and think about this. Go to the time out room. And which we're in, by the way, all we're in the we're all in our time out rooms right now, Skyping, you know, or, or you know, connecting th through um, digital means. But um, and there's two parts to that, where this time out is causing us to use less energy, to travel less, to consume less, to buy less. Um, it's causing us to connect with each other, sometimes maybe not personally, but to make these connections that we wouldn't normally make. Um, and it's uh, so it's teaching us that the thing that's in the movie is possible, but it's hard for us to get our heads around. It's hard to get your head around. Uh, when we've been told our entire lives that the solution is to buy more things, you know, buy electric cars, build more solar panels, 
uh, build wind turbines, um, you know, invest in green credits, invest in carbon offsets. And so to do the turnaround that the solution is to do less, we can actually get to be lazier. We get to not mow the lawn and up will spring wildflowers and butterflies will come back. Um, so this lesson in doing less is part of what we need to connect the movie with. Um, but part of the reason it's so hard is that we literally, the main thing we need to do is change the story that we're in. And when there was a time when Americans didn't know whether we want to be involved in World War II. And it took something drastic, something horrible, Pearl Harbor, to get us involved in the war. Then there was a time when we didn't know what to do to be involved. We didn't know how to invade the beaches. There was a time when this whole nation was, was filled with smoking and cigarette smoke. And we said, what are we going to do? We don't know what to do. And, and the turnaround is also, often has these points where um, I'd love to list 50 specific things, but it's more about us grieving and letting go of the old story and coming together to create a new story of how we're going to live where, where, where I like to say less is the new more. And what kind of world would we be in where we all took care of each other, lived closer together, um, where humans were eventually surrounded by more wild nature, nature recovering, um, and we all took care of each other and valued that more than we did flying all over the planet, getting my third iPhone, you know, in three years. So, um, you know. Do you think that, because the film points out how we're losing this battle, but do you think we can win it? We are up against a number of enemies um, mostly the one percent who like things the way they are. They want to. They want to make money, and um, and the fact that they've involved themselves now in the green movement is uh, really sad. And we're sad to. I mean, you call out some environmental leaders in the film, Al Gore, uh, for one, and you know, I mean, we all. I voted for him. I, I don't know. I think you voted for him. We all. He was elected president of the United States. <laughs> and um, and yet, you know, to see how, you know, he's decided to go down his path to help fix the planet. But we're not getting fixed. And it's been, you know, 14 years since an inconvenient truth. And the truth has become very inconvenient at this point. It's, and, yeah, we're at once the most destructive creature that's ever existed on this planet. We have to own that and Absolutely. understand we are. And, you know, 97% of all mammals are now humans, cows, and pets. 97%? You mean right. of, you know, of all mammals? All mammals on planet. 70% of birds are chickens. Since Earth Day, and probably maybe in the last 40 years, I, I believe something like half of all wildlife has died off. When we were kids, there weren't even hardly plastics. Now they fill the ocean. Right, right. But why am I hopeful? Because I know we are the humans. What we do is adapt and change. We can do that in a destructive way, but we can also get a new story and collectively come to grips with who we are and who we want to be. What an opportunity to actually invent the sustainable human and the sustainable culture and not pretend that giant industrial machines plastered across the landscape is going to make us sustainable. Uh, what an opportunity this is before us. And I look forward, I don't know that we want to get into it now, but we just, we need to have an entire show where we just talk about the millions of things we can get involved with and do, starting with, um, we need to either take over the current environmental movement or start a new one where we ask the question locally, personally, regionally, nationally, internationally, how are we going to have a world where we celebrate um, true sustainability, which is less of everything and sharing everything. To me, that's the real Green New Deal, right? Less of everything and sharing everything, taking care of everyone across this planet. Uh, you know, we Americans consume on average uh, three times more than most of the rest of the world. And some people, I, I believe, what is it, Ozzy? I know it's 20 or 30 times more than the poorest people on this planet, maybe 50 times more. Yeah, there's a huge discrepancy on the planet between the haves and the haves-nots. And so it's not just about 
reducing our consumption. I mean, it's really about reducing consumption in the rich world. Uh, and then there's other people in the world who, who need more. And so there's, there's that unequal distribution that's, that's so tragic as well that we have to keep in, in our heads at the same time. Yeah, I think, um, and that's what's great about Bernie and, and AOC, they're, they're each of their Green New Deals um, acknowledge this um, income inequality, acknowledges how the rich are screwing this planet, um, and ag- acknowledges the racial element of this in terms of the people, especially in, even in this country, who suffer um, because they live on the other side of the tracks, uh, environmentally suffer, economically suffer. And you're right, Jeff, I think that this, is, this, this um, Q&A is only an hour or so long. We'll, we'll do another one very soon, because I, I would love, the, the, the great thing about Alexandria and Bernie, when they wrote up these Green New Deals, they told us these were drafts. They, they, these were not edicts from them coming down from on high, but that these, these were uh, drafts. They wanted to ignite a discussion. They did that. And we all want to be part of that discussion. So maybe one of them will come on with us or we can, we can invite the people who are watching right now to join us again, maybe next week even, and have this discussion about what we all uh, can do to be part of a new deal. And, and it's not just a green deal. It's an economic deal. Because as long as we maintain the system of greed, we'll never get the green part. Those in charge, those in power, those who buy our candidates, we'll never, we'll never get there. And, and Bernie understands that, and AOC understands that. A lot of people watching this understand that. You just said, though, Jeff, about maybe you brought up the possibility of maybe we need to have a whole new environmental movement. Maybe, maybe what Greta has started, maybe what somebody watching this will start, that, um, you know, the movie doesn't say that, like, straight up. You just, you just said it. So what you just did was send a, a chill down the spines of certain people who are the, the leaders of this movement. And, of course, this is not to say that all the leaders of the movement are, aren't or haven't been doing what they should be doing. But, but the movie does pose a lot of questions about the path that we've been brought down by our leaders, our environmental leaders. By liberals and uh, and people who think of themselves on the left, and um, you want to add anything to that? I mean, yeah, it's, I, it's a provocative thing to say, but we shouldn't be afraid to say what what needs to be said. And and we love a lot of these people, and we support them, and we are grateful to what they have done over the years. There's absolutely no question about that. Yeah, I, th- I think what I'd like to point out is, um, you know, it's important to watch the film and get a sense of. Um, the story as it unravels and how, uh, in a sense, we've all gotten too comfortable uh, with the idea of, 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 of growth and expecting growth and expecting more and more and more. And so it's not surprising that the environmental movement would begin to sell solar cars, or electric cars right from their websites. And, you know, once you start saying that technology like solar panels that people are going to profit from, once you start advocating as that's the solution, you kind of lose your your role as an independent uh, person about the, about the truth. So I think this happens slowly. Um, but let's go back to the first Earth Day. And I, do you does anybody remember um, when the first recycle symbols uh, came into being? Were they little triangles with R R R three R's? Do you remember the three R's? No, I, don't, I remember the triangles. I don't remember the th- what, what. What do the three R's stand for? Reading, writing, and arithmetic. Reduce, <laughs> reuse, and recycle was the last choice. And so what's the happened? The idea was let's reduce our consumption. Right. Let's reuse what we have, not make more of it. And then recycle. You know, somebody asked, "Well, in the movie, you say that these things aren't recyclable and that that's not sustainable." Yes, you can recycle aluminum over and over again. Every time you do it, you use less energy than mining, but you still use a lot of energy to melt those aluminum cans down, to transport them. Um, there's toxic waste that comes out, both solid waste and waste into the air from, from recycling that can. Um, 
So, but what happened to all of us that we forgot the reduce and the reuse part, which was an original insight. So I think not only our environmental leaders, but we're all guilty of moving away from that um, into this disposable culture. Um, one other thing I'd just like to bring up that other that people ask me is, is that uh, we don't talk about it a lot in the film, but, but you see one of the things that drove me to make this, which is a chart that shows around 1800, when we first got addicted to fossil fuels, uh, the population of the world was about 700 million people. The whole world. The whole world. In the 700 80s. million. And that, so the last time we were not using fossil fuels to prop up the civilization, there were 700 mi million people, this global, the global population. And it took us how many years to get to that 700 million population? 20,000 years, however you want to measure it, 50,000 years. The early humans. And, yeah. yeah. And the last 200, we've gone up to 10 times to, to 7 million. That's that hockey stick, just like Al Gore showed in An Inconvenient Truth of the Carbon. That's the same hockey stick with population. Mm -hmm. But what's really flipped me out was when I added in the consumption. It's increased by 10 times on average. And for most of us, much more than that. Um, since we got addicted to fossil fuels. So that spike, when you add in the consumption, is just through the ceiling. So we very delicately bring up population because it's a, it's a subject that kind of, um, you know, it's almost not permitted to talk about it anymore. But definitely job one is our consumption because that's the thing we're so out of control with. But what scares me and what drove me to make this film is realizing in both those domains, we're so far beyond what the planet supported. Uh, was it even sustainable back then? We went through an ocean full of whales just to prop up an 1800s and 1900s lifestyle. We burned down all the trees in North America just to keep ourselves going in fuel and heat uh, because they use trees to power industry. Um, so this is, as in making this film, these things dawned on me that we're in so much more trouble um, then we realize, and it's not just the fossil fuels, it's we've expanded our human presence so far beyond what's likely to be sustainable. Um, and it seems like we're just kind of pretending that this can go on. And so what would happen if we all got solar-powered bulldozers and solar-powered fishing trawlers and solar-powered tractors and chainsaws, um, solar-powered yeah. cement factories? We would, just keep, we would just keep doing the same thing. Make more stuff. And it's green because a solar panel. I got a solar solar panel on the roof. I think Ozzy went through a similar thing with you know your understanding of the mess we were in. Yeah, it's it's a it's a really seductive story, and and it does a lot for us. And one of the things I really enjoy about this film is that you do such a good job of deconstructing that, and not just de deconstructing the energy part of it, which which is really fascinating. That's the part. Of, of the film that I'm in. And I, and I really geek out about that. But um, the thing that Jeff has done is he's broadened it to the story that we're in. Um, and I, I, that's the part of the film that I find so compelling because it's really our operating system. And we have to change that operating system before we can even start to think about how to move forward. And that's what this film does is it's, uh, it is really a reset and we're seeing it take off I think because people are so, uh, they yearn for something that's more genuine, uh, I think. Uh, I th like you said, Michael, there's been a lot of people emailing us saying, I was thinking about something like that. I knew something was wrong and I didn't know what it was. And, and thank you for making the film. And that was really heartening to see. Yeah, there's, um, let me read a few more of those comments. I'm just pulling them down here um, from YouTube. Um, my, uh, reading glasses here and don't you think it wasn't it amazing how many positive comments there were i mean i didn't even know that people on youtube could be that nice i, well, YouTube I was kind nice. of shocked youtube and instagram i have learned are the nice places to be oh really okay yeah no twitter you know if you're having a bad day just stay away from twitter that's all <laughs> i to say about that um uh, sammy moran says i watched it today from traverse city michigan it's a must-see planet of the humans I'm so glad my daughter and I watched it. It was a real awakening. Um, 
do it, Planet of the Humans. Andy or Amy Ackerman writes, I watched it last night, absolutely sobering. Excellent documentary. I hope lots of people see it. Uh, thank you for making it free uh, for everyone. Um, Nikki writes, I'm 40 minutes into the film, and it's the best doc about the lies of clean energy and the true cost to planet Earth that it takes to power our lives. Uh, full stop, best documentary. Everyone needs to see it. I've shared it with lots of Facebook groups and friends. Wow. Um, Jeff and Mike and Ozzy, uh, thank you so much. It goes, it goes, you know, pretty much on and on like this. This is an important movie. It's sobering to say the least. We watched it last night. I just woke up early in the morning and into my mind popped the ending of the film. Uh, yeah. My husband and I agree with a guy at the beginning of the film who says uh, we might only have 10 years to live. Hopefully a bit longer than that. But yeah, it's on and on like this, guys. It's uh, <clears throat> it's 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 amazing. And I encourage people who've watched it and are listening and watching us right now to please tell your uh, your friends and family uh, to watch this on my YouTube channel. Um, it's um, it doesn't cost anything. It's it's our gift to you. Um, and um, not, there's probably not been a better time uh, to watch it. There, um, I have another question here um, um, from YouTube where uh, this person asks, uh, what about nuclear power? Um, what are your feelings about that? Isn't that clean energy? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I've been, I was involved in the anti-nuclear movement back in the 70s when it was first beginning. Um, and I think you guys were involved too. And we've had a lot of feelings about this over the years to um, try and end this madness. But I, you, I think you guys probably have your own thoughts about it. Go ahead. Ozzy. Oh boy. Well, I mean, my experience with nuclear comes from my research, primarily uh, at Hanford uh, and the nuclear waste containment facility out there. I mean, there's a, you know, it started because I was really interested in this uh, tank at Hanford that has been storing nuclear waste since uh, the er development of early nuclear weapons uh, and energy, they com they grew together. It's very difficult to to dis uh, disassemble uh, the histories. Um, and it's really frightening to think that, that back then they were throwing, you know, the practices were much different than today, but they were throwing a lot of these uh, elements into slurry ponds and, and, and these giant, uh, they've then combined them into... Uh, larger and larger vessels, which are uh, at Hanford uh, out on the West uh, right now. And uh, they're very uncontrollable. They, 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 they're still alive. They're very much alive and they rock back and forth and they break out of their enclosures. And it's really uh, the kind of stuff of science fiction almost, but it's actually really happening. And uh, so I'm always having in my mind the, the dangers and the unanticipated consequences that come uh, from the development of, of nuclear power. But then, and maybe you can talk more about this, Jeff, but, you know, nuclear power is essentially, when you build these facilities, they are enormously expensive to build. And the reason is because there's so many materials and energy and concrete and steel that goes into building them. And then uh, it takes an enormous number of PhD scientists to build them and then run them for their entire lives. PhDs do not have a zero carbon or zero energy impact on, on the planet. Uh, it takes an enormous amount of, uh, uh, of infrastructure to support a society that educates people. And, and so when you start going back into the system and looking at the overall footprint of nuclear, uh, it, it starts to look a lot different. And Jeff, you can talk more about that too. Yeah. We just thought there were so many issues with nuclear that it deserved its own movie or book or uh, treatment somehow. And that we couldn't, you know, we didn't want to just bring it up and, and throw it away. But many of the same issues that, that uh, go into um, our concerns about renewables, you know, concrete is, I think, the third largest source of CO2 on the planet. It's the main ingredient of a nuclear plant. Steel takes a tremendous, tremendous amount of energy. Uranium to mine. The environmental destruction with mining uranium. Um, and then the story of like, oh, it's going to get better. There's a new generation. We constantly hear, oh, well, there's thor thorium reactors. Well, I don't believe there's ever been a real thorium reactor working 
uh, this existed on planet Earth, but yet thorium is going to save us. Um, so it's very much a very similar story to um, the illusion of, of clean energy. And, and again, what are we going to do with more nuclear power? Um, you know, we're going to do the same things we're doing now unless we end this myth that infinite growth on a finite planet is possible and sustainable and survivable. And the only reason we think that it's survivable is because basically this growth machine has served us very well. Maybe we're doing better than we were in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s. We have more stuff. We have more goodies. We have more people consuming more. And we confuse that with how the planet's doing. By every measure, things across the living planet, soil depletion, fish gone in the ocean, wildlife, the, the ocean's filling with toxins, and the air is now filled with microplastics. What's that going to do for us? The air? The air. The air is filled with, I don't remember the exact numbers, but there's microplastics, um, you know, in all the air that we breathe. You know, Mount Everest, you cannot drink the water from the snow on Mount Everest because it wouldn't meet water quality standards because there's so much pollution on Mount Everest. The small number of people, the scientists at the South Pole, have created pollution problems in the South Pole. And by the way, our fishing trawlers are circling there to get the last schools of fish. And there's still whaling going on with the last, you know, with, with the remaining whales that we have. So th this is what, this is where I get my hope from too, is because once we tune into the fact, it's not about more of anything, nuclear, solar, or whatever, it's getting a grip on ourselves. Right. Um, I have another question here. Your cameras and computers that are used for editing your film do the same damage and require the same materials uh, that solar panels use to make solar panels. Um, how do you answer something like that? That's a fantastic point. It's absolutely true. And so why am I living in a world where I get one camera, then another, then a third? Your crew has their cameras. You know, what would it be like to figure out how to share the cameras that we have, to have an editing space that we collectively share? Um, yeah, and I'd love somebody to begin to talk about how to restrain me from buying more technology, how to restrain myself. That's an excellent question. We all need to face this wherever we work. Do we really need to fly to Europe for the meetings? Or is that just what we want to do? Can we do this by teleconference like we're doing now? Yeah, yeah. When, when I started my podcast, and I didn't really know anything about how to do a podcast, and um, one, of the, one of the people that has a podcast and is also a big YouTuber, uh, Casey, um, I hope I say his last name correct, not nice that. Um, he set up a thing here in New York where you literally, if you want to use, uh, a, a, you don't have a camera and you need one for something you're making, uh, whether it's for your site or YouTube or it's, maybe you need something for your podcast, you literally can go down there and they'll loan out the camera to you, like a, like, like a public library. Uh, they don't charge anything. And I thought, wow, what if we all started doing, what if I started doing this? What if all of us had this attitude of, yes, I have, I have that camera over there. I have that light over there. It's not being used every day. Um, that's the world I want to live in too. After this, this self isolation, you know, I, I want to live in that world you just described. I think a lot of people watching this do. Um, so the, the question's a good question. You'll see in the film that's not quite the same materials that go into making solar panels. It's quite uh, what goes into the solar panel and into the wind turbine. You should watch this film and, and see what that what that's really about. But it's a, it's an excellent point. A lot of people too, Jeff, are asking you, I mean, it's just like you said, how come you didn't deal with nuclear? Uh, this individual is asking, this was a great film, but but no mention of animal agriculture. And how and the driving forces behind that, and how it's just devastating our environment. So many things people have sent in today. You know who because you know you're trying to make a 90 minute, 100 minute film. It can't handle all of this, and I know you've talked about the next film and the next film, and how we have to get into all these issues. But what's your answer to that? Because I think a lot of people will, by the end of this film, are going, God, you really got into that and that and that, but there's also that. <laughs> Yeah. Well, my answer to that is that's the yeah. ideal movie you want to make is where people, 
you want to have more discussion, Ozzy? Yeah, I was just thinking this is the same thing. I was like, that, that's probably the sign that we, we did the right thing. That, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get people to think. Uh, this isn't a movie to uh, spoon feed people answers. Uh, this is a movie that requires your thinking caps uh, before you push the play button. Right, right. Nobody will come see the movie four hours long. Jeff and Ozzy solve all the problems of the world. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> With your superpowers. Um, <laughs> Uh, Tim Tim here says, uh, guys, you totally messed with my mind. I thought we could just engineer our way through anything. Um, that was your bachelor's degree too, wasn't it, Ozzy? Yeah, it was. Yeah, mechanical engineering. Mechanical engineering. Yeah. Um, he says, I'm surprised at the level of uh, personal and cultural change that is needed to solve what we call climate change. Well, I heard you say that all through the making of this film, Jeff, that um, it's not just about climate change. It's about human change. It's about our change, your change, my change, the changes that need to take place. Um, this. Yeah, I was motivated by a uh, deep worry about climate change. And, and, and before Al Gore's film and before that time that we weren't uh, paying attention to it. But um, I've since learned that my frame needs to be bigger. And that's where I've really realize that we need to come to understand that the real problem is that we're a single species out of control on a finite planet. And that can't go on forever. Now in the movie, you, you see capitalism's role in that and the industrialists and bankers that run this uh, country and this planet, it's their role in that. Um, but it's a story that we've all absorbed. You know, we've, that's one of the things we can do is learn the skill of looking at ourselves as an entire species. Um, and I don't know what that means. I trust that lots of scholars and young people and old people and people with time on their hands because of a pandemic, we begin to think, what does it mean to look at ourselves and all the effects we've caused, all the human caused issues with the planet? Because if we solve climate change and we don't solve the problem of, of us, uh, we're still in big, big trouble. Conversely, by solving the, one of the problems of us during the pandemic, where we slow down and stop, we're also solving climate change. And, but just to remember, this is only the beginning. I think something like 20 million people have been born during this pandemic. You know, um, and we're going to go back to the growth if we, um, you know, if we just go back to normal, we're just going to go back to the same destruction. Right. Ozzy, what are your thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts are that these are, we're now entering into the territory um, where we're going to need a lot of thinkers and we're going to need a lot of people to start debating and writing and researching and doing journalism uh, on these topics. Um, and, and it doesn't matter. There's going to be a place for whether you're an engineer or a social worker or what you're interested in, it's going to be, it's going to take a lot of people thinking in a different way uh, to take us down this new path. Um, but I think Jeff's film really opens the way. The gate is open now. Uh, and it wasn't 48 hours ago, in my mind. Uh, and so I would like to see, uh, please watch the film, as many friends that you can share it with or watch it with friends uh, remotely uh, during this time. Uh, and then have discussions about it. And, and talk about what you might uh, envision for your, yourself and your community. People, um, again, looking at the comments here, they're, they're, they're surprised, they're not upset, but they're surprised that what they thought this was going to be turned out not to be that. What they thought it was gonna be was, it's not another one of the dozens and dozens of documentaries that are made about climate change, about um, um, you know, environmental movies, et cetera, some of which are excellent. Um, but it's not that film. It's a film that says that um, we in the environmental movement, we may have been wasting too much time on things that aren't getting us to where we need to be to stop things like climate change, the climate emergency that we're in. All that, all this and that, and that what is it about us? That, are we afraid to go after the beast, to go after the power structure? The same power structure that sets up our elections in the way they do so that there's 
there's no real democracy. Who wins the election isn't necessarily the president. You know, is it is it the is it it's the same power structure that makes people who are earning seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour beg to get eight dollars or nine dollars? Um, a system that throws black and brown people in prison um, in on a reckless basis. A system that spends more money on war and armaments than the next 10 countries after us combined. I mean, it's all this stuff and it seems so overwhelming to people. People are watching this right now. It's like, what can, what can I do? I'm sitting in Boise, Idaho. I'm in Topeka, Kansas. I'm in Augusta, Maine. What, what am I going to do? How am I going to save the planet in Augusta, Maine? And we were all talking about this earlier today. Um, and yes, there's all there's this individual responsibility we have to have to, you know, accumulate less stuff and and be kinder to the planet and to each other. But I think that there are things that people can do. They can start even planning it now while they're holed up at home or, you know, they're stocking the grocery shelves at 11 o'clock at night. And it's okay for the mind to go there to think about, yeah, you know, when this is over, this is what I'm going to do. And, um, and by the way, a shout out to all the people who are stocking shelves right now, um, who are in those Amazon warehouses, who are um, working in our hospitals. God, um, you know, de Blasio said yesterday they wants to do a ticker tape parade for everybody who put their life on the line so that we could continue to function. The people at the power plant right now who are allowing us to have the electricity and the way to, to talk to each other like this. Um, and uh, I want them to have more than a parade. I want them, they're not paid enough. They're not treated with enough respect. Um, and it's a long way down Broadway. I don't want to make them walk the entire length of Broadway after after having not had any, had any sleep for six weeks. But seriously, though, what can we, you know, as we're getting near the end of this, what can we uh, suggest to people to do? Should they maybe form their own new environmental group in their village, in their town, in their neighborhood? Um, what could that group do? You know, right away, one of the first things we thought of today was support Planned Parenthood. You want to help save the planet? Support Planned Parenthood. You see, you don't, some people don't necessarily connect those two things, but things like that, if we got, if we organize ourselves in such a way where we set up co-ops, where we learn to share uh, our, our things, uh, you know, this, this bike system that's in a lot of big cities now where you, you get a bike, you put a credit card in, that started in some towns where people were just taking their secondhand bikes and, and putting them in a rack and anybody could use them for free. And when you're done, Put it in the rack near wherever you end up. And then another person can use it for free. I, mean, I think there's so many things that we can come up with, especially even on a local basis. But we need new environmentalists. We need new leaders. We need new thinkers. We need young people to take the reins away from the boomers and the others who have done good work but haven't saved the planet. And it's kind of like, I hate to use a sports uh, metaphor, which I don't usually do. I've never done it in a movie. But it really is like if you've got your best pitcher out there on the mound in a baseball game, and one after one pitch after another, he throws and the batter hits a home run over and over and over. How many how long do you leave the pitcher out there on the mound? It's like we got to win the game. I think after seven home runs, you see the manager walk out, <laughs> hand me the ball. Thank you. Thank you for being one of the greatest pitchers ever. But today, this isn't working. And this is how I feel a lot about what's about what's going on. Thank you to everybody, especially the leaders of, of this movement, for what you've done. Keep doing it. We need you. But um, you we've got we need some new blood and some fresh ideas. Guys, share just share some thoughts of what people at home during this pandemic or post-pandemic, what they can do in their towns or their neighborhoods um, to um, 
not just have a, a, a new Green Deal, but a, a new environmental movement, a, a new environmentalists. The time is now. We are out of time. I'm so like this about it. Yeah, I think we need to. There's. We don't know what's going to happen with this pandemic, but as we come out of it, what if we started to think about um, what it's like to not ramp up the economy fully in the way that we've been used to and addicted to? Um, I mean, don't don't think of going back to quote normal by just ramping the hell out of this thing to where we're all back to dirtying up the air, consuming yeah. things we don't really need. It's How do we take care of each other? You know, in very specific ways. Uh, in our communities without having growth, which is what we're experiencing now. And honestly, we don't know if, if and when we're going to come out of this. I think we're going to come out of it medically, but we don't know how this, this pandemic is going to change things. It could change things permanently uh, or for a very long time. So we may need to, to do some real planning locally and in our lives for this new reality. And that would coincide with a new reality that we should be creating anyways. Um, you know, and if we're able to get around again, there's just there's so many things we can do even to protect nature in our own backyards. You know, uh, uh, some friends of mine went to this meeting uh, in our state capitol where they were deciding whether it was okay to shoot coyotes, and they were about the only two citizens there that showed up, and all the rest were people that were interested in shooting coyotes. And I thought to myself, "Wow, I am so busy with what I'm doing. Um, you know, there's rare species around us." we could all get involved in protecting. Um, so there's just so much to do, but it's got to be in the context of let's save the pollinators, for instance. But also, how do we stop the development that's occurring in our area? Could we pass laws in which there's no development on unbuilt land? We'll do all of our development on land that's already been messed up. We don't need to keep expanding. We'd probably wind up with dense cities like they used to have in Europe that were very walkable, bikeable. Uh, places. So, um, and then on the macro level, you know, we've got a U United Nations that still talks about sustainable development, sustainable growth. Um, you know, how do we influence the United Nations and the, the, the environmental movement as it exists to change that paradigm? Ozzy, what can people do? Well, I, I would love to see uh, people restart the environmental movement. In, in, a, in a majorly different way than we are right now. Uh, one of the topics of the film is the organization 350.org, which has made its way into colleges uh, around the country. And I would love to see students take that back um, and, and, and start creating their own environmental organizations uh, at their own universities. Uh, I would love to see the Sierra Club members uh, who are really interested in, in hiking, in wilderness, uh, to take back the reins of the Sierra Club from an executive branch that made deals with Michael Bloomberg uh, for millions uh, upon millions of dollars. Uh, I don't know what Michael Bloomberg's intentions were uh, with that program, but I know where it has led the Sierra Club, and it's not to a good place. Um, so as journalists, we could say, for instance, uh, if we want to interview the Sierra Club or get the opinion of the Sierra Club, we could go to the uh, president uh, of the membership. And I would uh, advise journalists to do that. Forget about the executive branch of the Sierra Club. The Sierra Club has two parts. One can fall off and we can keep the membership base and, and we can continue uh, that, we can move that organization forward uh, simply with the members who are interested in hiking and wilderness. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that I imagine and get excited about. And that's why I have some hope after watching this film. Uh, I don't I don't get depressed about it anymore. I get excited uh, because I see this new path opening. Yeah, every industrial solar development, fracking er development, every pipeline, every new thing that we put a stop to, uh, nuclear plant, um, we were able to stop, um, myself and some people organized in Northern Michigan, we stopped, uh, they had in mind four biomass plants for this area. Uh, we put a stop to it. Um, so... The environmental movement used to do that. It used to put a stop to things. And, um, you know, right now is a desperate time where every single field and forest and fallow uh, farm that gets redeveloped, that's the last place where the butterflies and the bees 
and the frogs and the songbirds that are disappearing. Um, that's our last refuge. So it really is the battle globally, but in our own backyards to preserve every single bit of land and water and ocean that we were able to. Uh, and we've also had this idea um, that we should actually sequester money. You know, money is a story that just keeps perpetuating. You buy something and somebody else buy something. You know, if you have money, make it a dead end into land that's set aside, never to be managed or logged, but just to manage itself and to regrow. Um, so, you know, we just got lots of thoughts, but I think the main thing I want to emphasize is there's nothing wrong with us sitting in this tension of the old story's not working. Where are we going to go? I think that's an okay place to live for a while. And I trust that the collective wisdom will come out the other side. We're the humans. We're the most destructive species ever, but we're the ones that can change when we really want to, as we've just demonstrated. That's, I believe that. I believe we can make this change, but um, it's going to require hundreds of thousands, millions of people, people watching this tonight, people are watching this movie, people are already involved in environmental groups to take a serious look at what we've been doing. Take a look at our strategy, our tactics. What Have we succeeded? Are we succeeding? Is the planet better off? I think we're on the edge of a cliff. And I have no intention of going over that cliff. So I will do my part to help form, to help hit the reset button, the reboot of this environmental movement. I know some of the, probably I'm guessing some of the leaders of this movement, if they're watching this right now, are like, oh, geez, you know, we're not coming for you. you we need you. Um, we just need to go back to that first Earth Day. Why did we all start caring about this in the first place? And we all thought back then in the 70s that we'd be handing our kids a much cleaner, better, sustainable planet. And our kids know what we've handed them. We've handed them a, a planet that's choking. And we've handed them a way of life that's all about money, making money, more money, more things, more stuff. Allowing politicians to get away with what they've gotten away with. They need to know we're coming. They need to see that we're coming. The last, I'm going to give the last word to somebody who just wrote this, just posted this. Uh, she says, capitalism creates capitalists. Humanism creates humans. We need more of that, less of the other. And um, I think we, we can make a good go of it. Everybody watch this film if you haven't seen it. If you've seen it, tell others to watch it. It's free. It's on my YouTube channel. Jeff and Ozzy and I, we've spent years working on this. And um, this is our attempt to try and turn things around. We obviously can't do this on our own. Um, we're going to need everybody participating. And I know, I know that, that you will. Um, Jeff and Ozzy, let's, uh, let's do this again, maybe next week. Um, uh, just look for a notice from us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram here on YouTube. Um, I want to keep this coming. I can see there's so many questions and comments that have been coming in. Uh, we weren't able to get to all of them in the hour. We're past the hour now. Um, we're actually um, heading over on, on another site on the computer here, uh, Jeff and I, to be live on, um, on Brian Williams on MSNBC. So, um, so tune into that if you want uh, in, in the 11 o'clock hour here. But I really want to thank uh, the people at ACT TV. Uh, they helped us make this uh, possible tonight. Um, many of you know who they are or you've seen their little logo. They are responsible for so much of the live streaming and so many of the of the of the video, so much of the good stuff. All the Bernie, all the great Bernie videos and the Bernie live streams, that's Act TV. Um, they they help good candidates they, that are running for office. They they do town halls, they do all this stuff. 
and uh, and they've helped me in the past. Uh, when um, finally I got Bowling for Columbine on a uh, on basic cable after mm, eighteen years, um, and there was Act TV to be able to to work with MSNBC and me so that we could do the after show afterwards. And uh, so my gratitude uh, to them and to, uh, to Brad and uh, Rebecca and Albert and uh, Harry or um, yeah, Harry, sometimes I call him Henry. Thank you. Uh, (laughs) There's a little Joe Biden in all of us folks. Um, But, uh, (laughs) but seriously, uh, man, these are, this is a good group of young people who are allow us all to talk to each other. So uh, thank you. And thanks to the other platforms that have carried this tonight, not just on YouTube here and my Facebook and Twitter, but now this has carried us tonight. Um, uh, Occupy Wall Street, uh, the, uh, the uh, Democratic Socialism Now. Um, I'm sorry if I've left anybody out who's been streaming this, but uh, thank you for for doing that. We'll do it again very soon. I want to keep this conversation going. And, and I want, I want people to ask their questions, enter into the debate, um, come up with the new ideas and support the younger generation. Cause they know what, again, what they've been handed and it's not fair what we've done to our kids and our grandkids. And, um, I'll leave it at that. Jeff, thank you. Thank you. Michael. Awesome. Ozzy, thank you. Thank you, Act TV. Thank you. Ansel, Act TV. Thank you, Basil Hamden, for uh, helping uh, produce this and making it happen. And everybody who listens to Rumble, uh, my podcast, thank you for participating in this. Go watch the movie um, or do something. Do whatever it is you do at this time of night during, <laughs> during the pandemic. We're going to come out of this. That much I know. This will end. And what we're doing to this planet, that's going to end too. That better end before the planet ends. And frankly, the planet may not end. The planet may end us. It may kill us before we kill it. I don't want, I don't want to participate in that battle. So let's fix this. Let's change right now. Planet of the Humans is the movie. Jeff Gibbs is the director. Ozzy Zenner is the producer. I executive produced it. Thank you, everybody, uh, for tuning into this. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again very, very soon. Take care.